Hello, everyone. I am Anirban Mahanti, lead advisor, one of the lead advisors at Seven Investing. And with me today, I've got Frank Wong, who's an engineering director at Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce, as you all know, is one of the biggest um, you know, um, SaaS companies on the planet. And uh, you know, I've been following uh, Frank on Twitter, and we're going to give you the Twitter handle um, when we tweet this out. Um, but uh, so you can also follow uh, Frank and, and just having interesting discussions with Frank. Because, you know, I love people who are at the intersection of technology and investing uh, because a lot of the investing that I personally do and a lot of the investing that we recommend actually at Seven Investing are technology companies. And, you know, we have a lot of SaaS companies that we have recommended. And I just love it when we have uh, people um, with that sort of background that we can sort of get, you know, the, you know, knowledge from the ground. So that's what we are, you know, trying to, you know, we try to learn a little bit about Frank today and, uh, you know, how did his investing journey begin? Who is Frank? What does he do? And how does he see the world of SaaS? That's sort of what we're going to cover today. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Annabeth. Uh, you are most welcome. Frank, I want to start, uh, you know, by asking a little bit about yourself. Like, you know, where are you from? How was your childhood? Uh, you know, how did you land? You know, uh, what did you do in the process, I guess, uh, when you were growing up? And, and just, just a little bit about you. So I think it, I find that very fascinating just to know that, you know, the world is full of people uh, with such diverse backgrounds that we can learn so much from each other. So let's start there and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was born in China, uh, particular Wuhan, where uh, it became famous last uh, last year uh, because the pandemic originated from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nothing very interesting in my uh, childhood. Um, I was kind of a normal student, uh, normal life. Um, yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, the, I think the maybe the interesting part is Wuhan. Um, it got hit last year really hard. Uh, we have like about uh, 11, 12 million people in Wuhan. And uh, when the pandemic started, it really like locked down the whole city. Uh, my parents, my relatives, everybody is there. Uh, it created this uh, uh, really, really scary moments. Um, and uh, my parents actually stuck in, the, in their condo, uh, small apartments for, for like three to four months without going out, out, out of the door. So yeah, and uh, they were so worried. Oh, are we even getting food? Are we going to be hung hungry to death? So uh, fortunately, yeah, government really, um, really like kind of uh, pushing the whole country to deliver food, uh, giving supply to the city. And, um, and so my parents are actually getting food every day from the community. They send the food drop off outside the door. So finally, um, they get past this really quickly. But, uh, but it was really scary watching the news, especially I was here, I, I couldn't help them. Yeah, like, I mean, the pandemic has been, you know, rough for all of us in various different ways, right? You know, we've all been separated, especially, you know, people, you know, you and I, we are sort of immigrants in different places. And you know, we have families in various parts of the world, which we haven't seen, I haven't seen. Uh, family for a long, long time. Uh, so yeah, I totally appreciate the, the difficulties. Um, I, I noticed that you then landed up somehow in Canada and you went to U Victoria. Uh, so I'm just curious about that. And I also saw on your on your LinkedIn profile that you did a couple of startups along the way, or at least a part of a couple of startups. I think Swap Guru and Delight Read were, were a couple of things that I saw uh, there. Uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, tell me about you know, landing up in, in Canada. Uh, and, uh, you know, doing those startups. Yeah, sure. Um, so after graduate from high school, I, uh, I, I was sent to Canada uh, to study. And uh, so we landed in uh, Victoria, Vancouver Island, near Vancouver. Uh, it's a beautiful city. So I was kind of study there, um, computer science with business uh, minor. Um, and uh, yeah, I, Actually, I, I wasn't knowing a lot of uh, computer stuff uh, before I came to study in the, in the university. So a lot of catch up to do, uh, a lot of interesting projects, everything. So it really stimulated my interest into uh, learning more and more computer science stuff. 
And uh, fortunately, I was landing a internship in a company called Business Objects, uh, later acquired by SAP. Um, so I was doing some interesting project there. And then they offered me a job after I come back to school. And then later on, I, after I graduate, I was fortunate to just to work there without worry about finding a job. If I couldn't find a job like within three months, uh, Canadian, like you cannot stay in Canada for, for long. So I was fortunate about that. And then later on, I got um, immigrate status. And uh, I was working at a uh, business objects for uh, six years in uh, Vancouver. Uh, yeah, we're literally building the first SaaS kind of applications there. Um, and I was involved in many different uh, interesting area of, uh, of work. Uh, for example, my first project was actually um, in, uh, like kind of uh, migrate the data from Salesforce into SAP data warehouse. And then we can do very good uh, BI business intelligence reporting on top of uh, the data. Uh, because at that time, Salesforce does not have a very good uh, uh, BI tool. So um, it was very interesting. I worked on like from the data warehouse to the web services backend to the full stack, everything. So uh, after doing a couple of these kind of projects, everything, I really want to start my own kind of uh, uh, projects or startups. That was kind of my dream, even until now. Uh, so I started uh, with a, a project called the Swap Guru. So the idea was just a kind of a, a selling useless items, making friends. So kind of like a social type of uh, uh, things. Um, yeah, so today I think something very similar is like let go or offer now. Uh, so at that time, yeah, I, I kind of imagine sim similar things. And, uh, and the other project I worked on was like kind of like personalized news. So we are ranking the news. Uh, we, once you browse, you can we deliver perfect uh, your interest news to you. So that was like back a long time ago. So uh, today we have very similar uh, services as well. So it's just, uh, I always like to explore things. So, um, but I never thought about investing in the first place. I was just thinking, oh, uh, building startup, everything. So yeah, that was uh, kind of uh, leading to my uh, regret, I guess, uh, started really investing last couple of years. <laughs> Actually, so um, how did you land up then? Um, so you landed up in SAP, uh, and then how did you land up in, so from SAP to Salesforce? Like, what's the journey there? Right, um, so after I uh, built up a lot of uh, SaaS applications um, in uh, Vancouver, uh, there are some opportunity came up in SAP in, uh, in Palo Alto office. So they want to build uh, the first generation of uh, SaaS for uh, Kind of a data migration tool they're kind of like a mule soft in a in a sense so uh they kind of uh find me in vancouver me and a few other colleagues uh kind of moved to palo alto we build out this uh new product here and then later on i um i joined success factor as well which is doing like hr similar to workday um and uh and then after that i really got it getting my status everything ready so I, I jump into a small startup called Health Tab, which is doing exactly what the Teladoc is doing today. Um, I, I was there for like three, three to four months, build out the kind of the, uh, the video chat application with a lot of uh, uh, rich UI in the iOS app. And then later on, my, uh, my boss, he joined this uh, startup um, in, uh, uh, joined this startup very, very early stage. So I joined them. And then last year we got acquired uh, by Salesforce. So that's that's how I ended up in Salesforce. Long story. Uh, so, so what I'm curious about is, you know, uh, you, one of the things you, you, know, you didn't mention is a time time frame. Like when uh, when were you actually building these um, SaaS applications for SAP? Like you know the the BI, um, you know the warehouse and data warehousing applications. And then when were you actually building? Uh, you know, like uh, a telehealth applications, like what, right, right. what year, what, what was sort of sure. the time frame? Sure, uh, I can give a little uh, like kind of timeline. So uh, I started in 2007 to build out this uh, data warehouse. Uh, so at that time we call uh, business intelligence on demand. So kind of uh, we have a really core product called a crystal reports, 
So we are kind of moving that uh, on-premise software into the cloud. So you can kind of uh, uh, mesh up data with uh, analytics. So you can kind of uh, collaborate there. So I, I built something like that 2007 to 2009. Also, we are also building another product very similar to uh, today, I guess, Slack, uh, uh, Chatter, uh, Salesforce Chatter, or some other like kind of uh, Twitter in a sense for enterprise. So I was also building up out of that uh, 2000. Uh, 10, 2009 ish, and then 2012, I guess we I started to building out these uh, uh, data services, uh, moving the data into uh, SAP type of uh, products, and then 2012, I I I was working on um, uh, success factor, kind of a human capital management uh, mobile apps, um, and then uh, 2014. We start building out uh, the uh, the health tab. So they already have that at that time. They already have like 15 million users, kind of like Quora. So you can post questions. Doctor will answer your questions, but they don't have a way to talk to that doctor directly. So mm. that's where I join in and then build out this uh, very interesting uh, video chat, uh, video calling uh, uh, feature. We charge like a hundred dollars per month. Uh, we thought we can get like a 1%, 2% kind of a customer base. Um, yeah, so it was interesting journey. We worked super hard, nine to nine, uh, six days a week. So very, very interesting. One of the things that I, I find very interesting about what you said uh, is just, that's just, you know, if you look at the timeline and when you are doing things, a lot of times what happens, and this is just anecdotal, right? But, you know, you're building the first, uh, you know, among the very first uh, SaaS uh, you know, human capital management software, which is probably what, like 10 years, 15 years before, you know, sort of SaaS has become trendy, right? And then everything is now on the cloud and sassy, <laughs> right? And the same thing, if you think about um, Teladoc uh, or other, not, let's not even use Teladoc as an example, but, you know, telehealth is sort of, you know, just maybe now um, hit this, uh, maybe inflection point, let's call it for the lack of a better word, where it is sort of now migrated from being niche to being, you know, maybe more mainstream, right? And what happens, and this is very common in technology where we see that a lot of things get developed early on and then they're just too ahead of their time. And then they, you know, get shelved or, you know, they didn't have the right go-to, uh, you know, market strategy or they didn't have the right, the technology was not mature enough uh, to enable. And you've seen that many times, like even in things like, uh, you know, um, the tablets, right? You know, the iPad is not the first tablet, <laughs> um, uh, you, you know, and, uh, you know, the Palm Pilot is probably one that people would remember was well before the iPhone and things like that, right? Um, yeah. So a lot of times the technology is just not mature, but, you know, people who have experience have seen it and then technology matures and then, you know, it starts becoming mainstream. And that's why I think from an investing point of view, it becomes really, really interesting. Uh, so I find that, uh, aspect from your story very interesting is that you know how um, how these things happen ahead of time. Um, switching gears, uh, Frank, uh, you're at uh, you know, and I'm, we're going to come back to sort of investing. But maybe let's you know switch gears and talk because we're talking about SaaS and and SaaS being mainstream. You work right. I call Salesforce the the granddad uh, of the SaaS world. It's the you know it's the biggest one of the biggest SaaS players in in uh, in the world today. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to think about is uh, if you think about the SaaS industry today, uh, how are you thinking about, you know, adoption in enterprises? Like, what do you see? Are, you know, enterprises clearly realize probably that they need to use SaaS tools. They probably need to be on the cloud. Um, but what do you see? How, what, what do you see has been the, I guess, the journey, right? If you go back five years, what was the sort of level of acceptance, and you know what? How much did you need to push uh, to get sales done, and people to realize the value of the technology, and and you know just the, the paradigm shift in usage. And then, if we go today, where we are in terms of that journey, and I guess, you know, is it early innings, you know, second innings, third innings, uh, right? Uh, that sort of you know, I'm just trying to understand where where you think we are in this journey right uh that's a great question i guess i can give a little bit of background how i observe this because when i was in uh, sap or when i was in success factors um 
Yeah, because the company already very big. So we already kind of, uh, kind of doing your own focus area. So I did not observe a lot of uh, activities until I joined this uh, uh, startup called Velocity. Um, I joined as like uh, number 11 employees there. Um, and we, five, in five years, we grew to over a thousand employees, uh, 20 offices in the globally. We have about 200 customers, big customers. So I, um, I kind of played all different roles in the Velocity, uh, starting from engineers to, you know, uh, building the team and uh, building the products and then uh, sort of selling into customers and then um, also helping customers deploy, go live, everything. So I talked to a lot of customers. I sort of see the journey. Um, being in the Silicon Valley really give you some kind of a forward thinking. I thought everywhere is the same, but it's actually not quite different, the opposite. So for example, uh, I can give you some example. Um, one of the biggest insurance company in uh, US, I did not even know oh, until 2014, 2015, they were still mainly using papers to, uh, to collect information and go door to door uh, to help their clients. So they really, they wanted to transform that into, uh, into, into using tablets, uh, recording the data uh, in digital way. So they can collect data, they can do a lot of interesting analysis, uh, also uh, be more efficient in a way. But I did not know oh, there's so many customers actually still using paper, still doing the old way. So yeah, so that, that's kind of mind blowing. Um, and in terms of where I see the trend, so quite a few years ago, I think customers are always willing to pay in US uh, because that's their uh, kind of uh, culture. Oh, they, they were used to pay, you know, like a lot of money for SIBO systems back in the 90s. And then later on, they, they're still willing to pay in uh, Salesforce. So they are willing to pay, but the mind shifting into SARS is getting accelerated in a way. Because before we're trying to push them, oh, you got to do this because this will you know, save you money, save your cost uh, and uh, deploy faster. We, we come up with a lot of a value proposition for those customers trying to convince them. But uh, later on in the, when we are, uh, in the later journey, a lot of customers, you know, are, no, oh, this is a do or die moment. They have to transform. Otherwise they're gonna beat by other um, competitors. Like one of, the comp uh, one of the interesting thing is we are doing many different verticals in uh, Velocity. We're doing like insurance, telecommunications. Uh, uh, we're doing like a government, many different verticals. So the trends are a little bit different from each vertical. Like telecommunication is actually much more advanced vertical than health insurance or insurance space. Uh, but later on, they are picking up. So one of the interesting thing is uh, insurance space, we got a few bigger customers and they're like, oh, there's a little startup called uh, Lemonade. They are really grabbing our shares. They are creating something really cool. Um, you know, you can easily just using the app to get an insurance quote. We want to do something like that. So I actually build uh, some something similar to Lemonade mobile apps to help all the insurance companies. So, um, so it's sometimes it's not about the, the technology to build out the Lemonade technology is not that difficult, but uh, is how the business can transform because even they have this, may, it may not be easy for them to adapt because then what, what happens to their existing customers, how they are transforming, right? Um, but they clearly see the need of uh, transform. Otherwise they will be, you know, be behind, a lot behind. Uh, telecommunication is the same. We work with Verizon. They come up with a sub-brand Verizon uh, mobile and uh, it's cheaper very easy to do self in self-service mode and uh, people can just sign up by themselves. So yeah, a lot of transformation all around the uh, globe. And uh, Excellent. yeah, go yeah, ahead. So I was, going to say, I was going to say that, you know, like I, I think I, you know, that makes sense that there's a lot of transformation happening. Uh, certain industries are uh, potentially uh, just, you know, starting to adopt. Some industries are well advanced in their adoption uh, phases of, uh, you know, technology, digital transformation, as you rightly put it. Well, uh, one comment that you made that I thought is very interesting is you said that, you know, certain things like, you know, let's not even, you know, be specific to say lemonade as an insurance, you know, technology, 
that is making insurance easy. But a lot of the time, I think what you're basically implying is a lot of the time the technology underlying something is potentially not groundbreaking or that difficult, right? This, this will be, of course, you know, there's, you know, I guess the, the limiting factor probably is hiring the engineers you need uh, and, you know, having a product manager or a, 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 you know, chief technology officer who can build the roadmap and then, you know, building the product is number one. And then I guess having number two, a go-to market strategy. So a related question to this is, we, there are tons and tons of competitors that are propping left, right, and center, right? So, um, Eliminate could say that your insurance market is fragmented and I want to get in with technology as an edge and then capture market share. There's so lots of different, you know, as you said, um, you know, Slack, for example, just got acquired, right? Um, but it did build a pretty significant business being a chat application effectively, right? If you think of it as a, as a basic chat applications have been around for ages. Right, I mean, you know, people used to do Yahoo chats back in, like, you know, to, in the year two thousands. So, uh, I guess if technology is not a differentiator, then how how do you see this um, the landscape? Right, I mean, there's new companies and existing companies that are trying to, you know, maintain their lead. How do you see the tension, and and how I guess how do you distinguish between, you know, what's going to win and what might not win? I, I know this is a difficult question, probably, but. You know, as someone who works on these things, what do you think? Right. Um, so usually, <clears throat> why uh, those startup company exist is they usually maybe a insider, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, they observe some huge pain in customers area, and the bigger company they are not address it uh, quickly enough. So that's why they like Eric Yuan from Zoom Video, right? So he he kind of uh, frustrated. He come out and build their own startup, really addressing the biggest pain point for customer. So that's how they started. And uh, later on, when they building better and better, the bigger company will notice this. Oh, this is uh, now becoming a little bit more interesting competitors, and they are eating our space. We want to get into. So they start to building out. Uh, similar maybe shifting their focus to to compete in certain area so there are always going to be you know a very uh how, how do you say like a very good healthy uh competition because in the end customer will uh getting all the benefits right so um i guess the bigger advantage for the bigger company of course is they got a lot of more resources a lot of uh, bigger, you know, presence. They can leverage their existing, you know, ecosystems to to say, oh, you you want to buy this, um, you know, marketing cloud, um, but you will getting a benefit of moving to other clouds. So so then you don't have to worry about upgrade, and uh, we always have the the biggest, you know, all the features for you. And then in a smaller company, they will help addressing the quick uh, the problem quickly. They will, you know, tender the customer, you know, helping customer more deeply because they basically uh, live with the customer, you know, so they will solve the problem faster. So then a customer will have a kind of a interesting dile dilemma. Who should I choose? Bigger company mm. or the smaller ones, right? <laughs> so th I think that's where the uh, kind of the, the, the competitions are. And the, in many cases, why nowadays there's a lot of microservices, a lot of a uh, uh, plug and play type of a uh, software is because big uh, customer realize, oh, I probably buying a Oracle or some bigger company does not uh, going to solve all our problems and may not can dis differentiate us to our competitors in, in some ways. So I wanna pick, choose the best part of each different component Let's say if I wanna, you know, uh, if I wanna build a uh, cloud, I probably pick like AWS. But uh, if I wanna do, do analytics, I I maybe pick uh, Google uh, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, and then I maybe pick, you know, uh, deploy somewhere else like for uh, Cloudflare for CDNs, or I wanna build a maybe portal using CRM. So they wanna choose and pick uh, their uh, best uh, technology they think. And also, also, it also depends on the customer who their teams are. If they have a very heavy IT team, a very talented developer team, maybe they will choose differently than some other customer. They they just don't do uh, do things differently. 
right? So um, <clears throat> I think a startup have a <coughs> have a good way to kind of see the picture and uh, uh, pivot to the needs. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I, I actually love that because I think what you described is 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 basically the ecosystem of innovation, right? There, there is always going to be, um, you know, there's going to be pain points that companies, you know, there's so many pain points that you need to address. Uh, it's just hard for a big company to choose and select which ones they're going to do, right? So there's always going to be a, an issue of, I want to focus on this. This is my core business and I'm going to focus on that. And if somebody has a passion in a business that's not really the core business, then you know, they, for them, maybe spinning out or, you know, doing a startup to solve that problem. And then they eventually, you know, because it's not the core focus of anyone, I think the Eric one example of video uh, calls, you know, we are using Zoom today, right? Uh, I mean, video in some form has been around for a long time, right? There's been Skype, there's been, you know, there's um, there's been WebEx, there's been so many other things, but this just made it slightly better, a little bit better, a little bit easier to use uh, with a good market, you know, go-to-market strategy that, you know, and then you, you become the product of choice. And once you become the product of choice, you can quickly grow. And, and I guess competition doesn't take note of you until you're big enough. At which point, I guess you have the best people developing the best solutions in sort of the video world for you. And it's, you know, it's a competitive game, right? Which uh, I think is, is, is fascinating. And of course the markets tend to be pretty big, right? If, if, yeah. if, uh, if Zoom is this big today, uh, it is because this market is big, right? And video comms are important and so on. So I, I love that. I think that's a great, interesting insight. Yeah, um, one, one thing I maybe I, I can add a little bit, I think it's a common kind of a misunderstanding from the investor point of view. Uh, uh, I think it's a misunderstood opportunity here is that uh, they all think, oh, it's a big company. They're going to have, they're going to outrun the smaller guys. They're going to crash them because uh, why, you, you know, like why AWS CloudFriend cannot build something that destroy fastly or uh, Cloudflare. So um, from the bigger comp company perspective, actually it's a lot harder to disrupt the space uh, in many ways. Like one way would be, you know, uh, it's the bigger company already have a ton of uh, different feature. Uh, they're going out, you know, according to different cadence. It's very difficult actually to say, I want to quickly build out these and deploy to the customer like within a, like a month. It always has to go, go into like slowly. So that actually add a lot of uh, constraint. Uh, for example, when I was in uh, Velocity, we built out a feature that a customer wants maybe two, three weeks and then ship it to a customer maybe like in a month or two. But, uh, but uh, for the bigger company, they probably take like six months to a year to really doing the same thing, uh, push out the door. So if you multiply that by a lot of more requests, a lot of more feature, you can imagine a big company will be much, much more delayed in that sense. So I, yeah, like in terms of talent, probably they got both got a very good talent, but uh, because the process, the way they ensure, oh, if I uh, deploy this feature, to like a million different customers, how can I assure all the customer getting the same, the best quality? They don't report error to us. What if they, you know, uh, ship a really unpolished feature, then customer will feel, oh, a, a million of them will have like mission critical states. And then, yeah, the company will get burned, right? The big company. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, this, it's just the, it's too big to really moving it fast enough to accommodate the customer's needs. So that's where I think the smaller company has a huge edge. Excellent. I will ask you one more thing about enterprise uh, software before we sort of move on from enterprise software. Where do you think in enterprise software there's gonna be most value created in the next 10 years? Like what, what's the, I guess the leading bleeding edge of enterprise software right now? Just in, not even, to, I, not specific companies, but just, the areas, like which which ones are really like, if you had to pick three, top three enterprise software areas, um, what would they be, and why? I guess. Um, yeah. So um, I think the mo why SaaS company uh, create value. Uh, I think Anderson Horowitz uh, wrote a paper saying software is eating the world, like back ten years ago, 
and somebody else quoted, uh, you know, every company will becoming a technology company. Otherwise, they will be, you know, eliminated or obsolete. Um, so now, a mm. lot of companies, they want to transform, they want to, you know, digital presence. So uh, those SaaS company can help them, you know, uh, get there. Also, you know, um, make them more efficient in a way, uh, lower cost of their internal, you know, uh, organization. They probably can do things like five people instead of 10 people before. Like before you have a huge IT team. Now the biggest company has a very small IT team. Uh, that says a lot. So those are the areas that the SaaS really creating values here. Uh, in terms of the trend or the big needs, I see uh, pandemic created this uh, really huge working from home um, trends, hybrid working mode, uh, but the software really actually not very good right now. We can only use in Zoom, maybe some Slack or Microsoft Teams, but really you, you miss the environment of working with your team because it's still different. So I think that's a big area. A lot of company will trying to do something really good in this space to make you feel in the future, it's equally the same as working from home or working in the office. Um, we already see some kind of a shift before because before you have to be in the office, you know, because we don't even have Zoom or some software and uh, all the servers you host in the company. So you have to go to the company to, you know, to do things. But now everything is in the cloud. You don't have to go to the office, but I think we're going to go into much further, uh, further advanced in this uh, hybrid working software. Uh, so I think that's one. Um, so there's a lot of going to be a lot of uh, collaboration tools, a lot of uh, video tools, a lot of tools that help like really just talking each other, like clubhouse type of things. So that's uh, number one. Number two is, um, you know, the data, we're getting a ton of more data. So the data part will be, so how do we make, make the data make sense? So like the machine learning, AI, on top of a data lake, data warehouse, uh, that sort of a, a innovation. I think it's going to be uh, driving the future as well. Um, and then the third one would be, how do we further enhancing the, uh, the enhancing the, like the collaboration, make sure like eliminate the cost. Like the UI path is one of the company I, I really love like five, even five, six years ago, I look at their demos. Um, so they really eliminate a lot of a manual work. Anything we do repeatedly, I think it will be eliminated in the future. So like the machine or the computer program can do it for you. And the uh, human should be focused on innovative, creative uh, work. So I think uh, that's where we are going. So UiPath or like the newer kind of a, uh, robotic processing software will be a big, bigger space in my opinion. Okay, so robotic automation, automation basically of uh, almost like, it's like outsourcing that to the robot, right? I mean, we, we, you know, one version of outsourcing was business process outsourcing to humans at a cheaper labor point. Now you're saying that, you know, the next sort of, uh, next step is to outsource it to software. It's potentially cheaper than the human, um, uh, which is interesting. Uh, has, has implications for jobs in various locations. Um, excellent. Okay, I, I want to ask you some investing things and then we'll come back to sort of uh, investing areas. So I guess uh, quickly, when did you sort of get actively interested in investing, you know, taking your knowledge and applying it um, uh, to investing? And then sort of, you know, briefly, uh, you know, what you were doing in sort of your earlier you know, early days of investing, what you're doing now, sort of how has your investing journey or process changed? Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to share that with us. Yeah, it's, uh, it changed a lot. Uh, in my 30s, uh, in my 20s, I never thought about investing. I, uh, I just really interested in building a startup. Um, so my friends told me some investing idea like, oh, investing in gold. So I actually bought some gold bars until now, it's still in my security box. Uh, I bought it in 2008. It's worth practically the same. So that was a really bad investment. 
um, later on, I because I, I I was getting married and everything, so I bought some properties in Canada. But that wasn't really in investing. I was just oh buying a condo, moving to a townhouse. I couldn't sell my condo, so I kind of kept all my properties. Um, nowadays, uh, when I realize, oh, actually, it was a good investment. My, I made some uh, made some money on that, but. Uh, um, my serious investing, I think, started in like uh, 2018. So it's just uh, three years ago. Um, the reason I was doing that was, um, uh, you know, like my, my wife actually diagnosed from stage four cancer uh, in 2018, uh, 2017, December. And uh, it was a uh, devastating, you know, news for our family. Um, yeah, I have two young uh, kids. Uh, they are now nine and five. So at that time, I was kind of a uh, uh, shocked everything. Uh, so uh, and then in two, yeah, so we we kind of went to doctors, everything. Uh, I was doing research on like the uh, biotech uh, kind of a to help her uh, that type of thing. And then in 2018, I uh, you know I thought about oh how what I what I'm going to do in my future. Uh, because uh, I need a plan, right? So I started thinking about how to invest. Um, yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I was like watching watching YouTube, doing a lot of research. Um, at that time, I think also um, because of my wife's uh, kind of condition uh, and also like kind of things. So I was less of a hands-on of a coder in my company. So I, I was kind of managing people, let them do, do the work instead of me. So I have a little bit more time, but fragmented. So I was just trying to do a lot of research on how should I invest. So I came across like uh, Phil Tom, um, uh, like uh, Manish Pabre, a lot of value investors, Buffett, Charlie Munger, uh, give me some good ideas. And then I, I switch a lot of different investing styles as well along the way. Um, but really, I, I think of my, um, like the, really the, the ones I really like was from Motley Fool. Um, at that time I came across uh, David Gardner. Um, he's like YouTube channel. He said about the, all the rule breakers. Uh, it really hit my heart. I, I really like it. So I subscribed and then listened to them. I think that, uh, so the investing not only changed my uh, kind of a financially, like changing my life in a way, but also uh, it helped me overcome my fear because at that time I was in a very hard situation. And uh, every night I was just listening to some recording from the Molly Fu uh, and other investors, uh, also changing my kind of a listening a lot of motivation video uh, videos or talk. So it really changed my mind. Uh, folks less about my uh, my wife's uh, condition, uh, more of oh, how I'm going to, uh, how are we going to tough through that? So so that's how I started. And uh, um, yeah, really, really, it really helped me. Um, I'm learning a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the history, the presence, the, the big picture, the microeconomics, the future. So uh, it helped me. Um, and then Last year, um, it was difficult because my wife passed away uh, last June. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, but I just keep going, keep uh, keep like uh, looking forward. I was of course in a uh, like devastated, you know, depressed state. But uh, yeah, investing has really helped me. So I still continue to do my ritual. You know, uh, keep learning, keep doing things. Uh, I counted from 2018, like I started 2018 June. Until now, I spend over uh, almost 10,000 hours in, in investing, like just learning different things, everything. So um, yeah, now I, I think I'm getting getting better, getting back on my feet and everything. Um, so so yeah, so that, that's kind of my journey. And um, along the way, I, I get to know a lot of people from Twitter, a lot of uh, good advisors like Seven Investing, was one of the surveys I also looked it up and uh, watching you guys um, talk also smoothed me, not just the, you know, the talk, the stock ideas, but also kind of like I have friends there kind of talking. Um, so it really, it really helped. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of my, you know, habits now, just watching Seven Investing, watching Molly Fu, watching a lot of uh, good investor, their mindsets, focusing on the long future. And uh, uh, now I have a goal. 
my goal is to really, because my company got acquired, so my investment size actually a very sizable amount. So, um, so I want to build this in the longer future, maybe 10, 20 years, maybe in 10 years, I want to start to have some fund to go into helping like uh, the patients like my wife, uh, cancer patients in China, because they couldn't afford a lot of uh, expensive medicines. So they sometimes they don't get a treatment. So I want to help them, you know, with my funds. So that's kind of my goal for uh, investing. And then myself, hopefully this funds is large enough and comfortably I will do my own startup. So that's kind of my future goal here. I, I did not know this uh, story, Frank, uh, my, you know, uh, my, uh, my sympathies and condolences with you. I actually did not know that uh, your wife passed away. So I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, and it's good that you have um, figured out a way to you know, move forward, it's really hard, right? I mean, moving forward when, when you lose, uh, you know, near ones and dear ones. So I, I understand, sympathize, and, you know, off, offer um, my best wishes really going forward. I appreciate um, and, and I really like the fact that you, you're thinking about doing something for others, which is really, really commendable. Um, I think that's, that's ex excellent. Um, I was going to ask you, so outside of, software, enterprise software, what are sort of, in a few areas that you watch, um, you know, and what's exciting and why? Right, um, I, I think I really like the biotech, uh, you know, healthcare industries, because I, while I was doing research uh, for, my, for my wife conditions, I came across a lot of good companies that they are trying to, you know, help the patients, help the world run better. So. Definitely in 10 years, I want to focus more on that. But right now I realize oh, it's very difficult to invest in that space. I invested a couple of companies, but later on I transfer a bigger fund into ArcG uh, type of uh, ETFs. So that helps. Uh, personal interest, I really like uh, e-commerce space because I, I build a lot of us kind of startup ideas around e-commerce. So that's one area I like. Um, and then uh, EV is another place I, I really like. I just I just love like Tesla and uh, some other uh, Chinese uh, EV cars. So I invest in that place, uh, watch a lot of videos. <laughs> so yeah, that's, and also uh, e-commerce uh, EV, it's uh, similar. It's just sometimes a different metrics, but uh, once you get a feel, you know how to evaluate them, how to, yeah, how to invest. So. Um, so yeah, those are my area interest. Excellent. Okay, so if I asked you to be a you know stock picking person for one day, uh, and I said, okay, give me three uh, stock ideas, uh, which three companies would you be comfortable saying they're you know, interesting buys at uh, today uh, that people could potentially hold for the long term? Uh, I'm just right. curious what what you think uh, are interesting ideas today and why. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for my investing, I really like to invest in, uh, you know, a great products first, and then the product can address a large space uh, following maybe a big trend. And then I really like to, uh, to invest in leaderships uh, because when I, when I was in Velocity, I see the, how leadership can overcome those uh, really, really difficult situations. So no matter how great the, the you know, the products or the, the company, uh, you're always gonna have some lot of issues. Uh, so the leadership management are really important there to solving the issues. Uh, and also the last one would be, uh, you know, like the really potential growth, uh, also very important. So based on all these criteria, I, I, I kind of uh, have my watch list or the, the stocks I own. So like my favorite uh, SaaS company is Zoom videos. Um, so definitely I want to invest in that um, because it's it's really great product, right? So it, uh, it started from very small, but last year, even during the pandemic, it got like hundreds of millions of people using that and they don't like crack down, like everything is working smoothly. So they got like great leaders and a great engineering team, everything. Um, and now it's cheaper than ever. So I was actually running a uh, chart 
uh, right now the EV, uh, EV to sales ratio is like 30. So it's cheaper than 2019, 2020. So with so much improvement and they are relatively you know, cheaper uh, Zoom. So I would definitely um, invest in them. I think in 10 years, probably Zoom will be our major way of doing everything communication wise. It doesn't matter consumer or enterprise. So I think they got a huge uh, way to go. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I like Fastly. Um, I also like Cloudflare, but uh, Fastly, I think it's it's a misunderstood opportunities here. Um, they got a really great product. Uh, average selling price of now is like 800,000 uh, and get the best company to use in those uh, products like Shopify, Kayak, Ticketmaster, a lo lot of great company using them. Um, from the startup point of view, I know how hard it is to sell into those, the best company in the world. It took years and they don't have a really great sales team uh, enabled, but they already can sell to those companies. And, you know, so that says a lot about the, their products. So now because of their difficulties right now, I think they are, you know, very, very attractive EV um, multiples. Uh, if they enable their sales team, they can really grow, accelerate their growth and uh, they, they can be like growth and multiple expansion. So they can achieve like 10 times, I believe. Uh, fastly, if they can execute well, it'll be uh, 10 times from here in five years. Uh, and they're also behind a cloud uh, edge computing trend as well. Um, we already see a lot of uh, good applications. They can just deploy to the edge computing and uh, you don't have to really using the like centralized servers anymore. So that's the second one. The third one would be, I like to, in, uh, I like to invest in a little bit early in the, uh, in the trend, like lower multiple still, but a great potential companies. Uh, Pager Duty is uh, one of them I really like. Um, from two years ago, the IPO until now, their stock price did not move a lot, uh, but they actually doubled their customers. They create a lot of more software uh, features. Uh, they, they just got a lot stronger, but their price are not moving much. So actually I enter in a very good Price. So now it's like already uh, 60 times, 60% up, but uh, I think they have a long way to go. A uh, lot of time in, in the company, I see we are using a lot of uh, uh, new uh, so, uh, software. So like PagerDuty, uh, we, I, I really like it. So you really can help the team organize, make it efficient, some other software as well. So this is one of the, another uh, area or category I like to. Uh, invest so pager duty is in in this category. So pager duty is uh, audio software. Is it? Is that what uh, pager duty does? Uh, I have actually not looked at pager pager duty carefully. Uh, yeah, pager duty is a uh, instance management uh, software. So basically, they uh, help. For example, if there's any issue with uh, like production, they will send um, notification to okay. uh, whoever responsible. Uh, either developers or IT or DevOps, uh, but they organize in a way that it's easier uh, to uh, coordinate who is actually on call to help out on the issues. Uh, because we are moving to the cloud, um, you could deploy to AWS, uh, Azure, many different cloud pieces of microservices. So you need to monitor software like Datadog uh, to monitor, but uh, if there's any issues, uh, Page Duty will be helping out on that. Uh, like, oh, this guy is on call. We reach out to him, and he can solve the issues. So I think because of this big tailwind to the cloud, uh, so we really need this kind of uh, instance management software. So this is like taking the Motorola uh, sort of phone that the police and the fire people used to carry a long time back, and basically saying that this is the software version of that sort of sort of like, you know, taking the, you know, making, I guess, audio calls or pings or text messages or whatever, it sort of this basic idea. Very interesting, okay, cool. Right. Um, uh, okay, uh, my, I guess, final question or is uh, what would you say to your younger self? Like uh, from an investing point of view, for example, what would you, I guess, do differently? And what advice do you have um, for people who want to get into uh, investing and start the investing journey. Right. Um, 
to my younger self, I because I started investing really late, late 30s, uh, it's never too late, but uh, I would uh, tell my younger self, you should invest in really early, uh, make mistakes, um, and then learn from it, finding your, you know, your expert areas, and then just keep doing what you're doing, build a, build a financial independence. So then you can, you are more free to do whatever you want to do. And it's really actually uh, because my company acquired. So I, actually my perspective changed a lot. And my wife, of course, my wife incidents. So I'm, I feel totally different from uh, before. So I think if, if younger myself start investing early, probably will be or changing their perspective, learning more different aspects of the things. I feel investing really opened up a lot of new windows for me, in a sense. Uh, as far as for, uh, you know, wh whoever is investing, I think um, I think we should uh, invest in a way that uh, I really like, uh, I think David Gardner's uh, quote, uh, you make your investing really reflect the future of, uh, of what you imagined in the world. Um, you treat your investment as your, you know, you are a stakeholder of those companies and you are kind of working with them, let them create, you know, a new future for us. So we should think about long-term, not uh, just, oh, I want to gain like 30%, 40%. If you are looking at the gains, just like startup, you will be very short-term focus. You wouldn't make the startup really huge to address huge problems. So I I, I hope everybody can think in longer term and really make your investment like like mini, uh, make a meaningful impact in the world. Thank you, thank you, Frank. I enjoyed this conversation to our listeners, Seven I listeners. Uh, Frank Wong, uh, engineering director at Salesforce. Um, if you want to follow Frank uh, on Twitter, it's at Frank Yan Wong. So that's Frank F R A N K Yan Y A N Wong W A N G. Uh, give him a follow uh, and hear his thoughts. Um, you know, he asks lots of questions on Twitter, which I, I find very interesting. Um, and yeah, thank you, Frank, uh, for being with us today, for spending your precious time and uh, you know, stay in touch. Thank you so much for having me.